start just by praying. Um, Lord, we just come before you right now, God, and I uh, just thank you, Father, just uh, for every woman that's here, Lord, and just uh, for your word, God, that just brings us so much comfort and gets us through everything in our life, Lord, and I pray right now, Lord, that your Holy Spirit would fall upon this place, God, that your Holy Spirit would touch our hearts and that we would be changed, and um, Lord, I just pray that you would speak through me, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. So um, the, the scriptures that are for me today are Titus um, 2, 11 through 15. And the message of this um, Bible study is called Trained by Grace. So I'm just going to start with um, just reading the scriptures and then we'll go through everything. So verse 11, Titus 2, 11, 1 through 15 says, For the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in the present age, looking for the blessed hope and glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us that he might redeem us and purify for himself his own special people, zealous for good works. Verse 15 says, speak these things, exhort, rebuke with all authority, let no one despise you. So the way that I'm going to proceed with this is I'm just going to answer the who, what, where, when, why, and how of these scriptures. So I'll ask a question and then I'll try um, my very best to answer. So the first um, question that I'm going to ask is who, who has appeared? So if we look at verse 11, it says, For the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men. And I love it that God's grace brings us salvation. It's never anything that I do or that you do. It's always God and his grace. And in that part, I have to be a willing participant. God's grace comes, but I have to be willing to allow his grace to change me. And I have to yield my spirit to his spirit. Um, It's a beautiful concept and a privilege that our spirit can align with God. Like that is actually like mind blowing, (laughs) really, if you think about it. Um, This grace that has appeared has appeared to all men, not just to us in this room, but to all men in the whole world. Um, Romans 119, 20 tells us, what may be known of God is manifest in them, for God has shown it to them. For since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. And um, I just love that because I, I know a lot of people. I have like this large family, and sometimes I feel like, I, I feel like, man, All these people that I know, they're not saved. They continue to walk in sin and separated from God. And I feel that if we forget that God's grace has it all, we put this burden on ourselves and we think that it's our responsibility to do something that really it's God's responsibility. We are to do what he asks us to do. But at the end of the day, um, I don't have to be overwhelmed or anything about it because God has got it all in control. Um, so I just put that that can be confident that has that God has revealed himself through his grace to everybody. So I feel that that takes like a lot of pressure off of us. Um, the next question that I am that I'm gonna ponder and ask is what is the Lord teaching us? What is he teaching us in these scriptures? And In verse 12, it tells us that teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly. And knowing that God's grace has come upon us, what should we be doing? Like we we just said, we know this. We know that God's grace has come upon us, but what should we do? The first thing that Paul tells us here is to deny ungodliness. And deny means to refuse to refuse to, like, we don't want anything to do with ungodliness. And ungodliness um, 
means to deny or disobey God. And we are women of the church, of the of the word, and we should want to live and um, just follow the word of God. So um, when we see ungodliness, we should be bold with God with God's grace, not in our own strength, but we should be bold with God's grace and not conform to this world. Especially when people, I know I had this. For me, like when people come against me and think that I'm crazy because I believe in this Jesus, I think that especially then um, we should, especially when people come against us, maybe even attack us because of our faith in Christ, we should just be bold in that. Because of the blood of Christ, we have the power to stand fast for righteousness. We see so many ungodly things every day in our society. Every day, like we walk out of these doors and it's just crazy the things that we see. But I have this conviction in my heart like that even though the world does not agree with us, does not agree with us about our Jesus, I think that we could be a fresh breath of air to the to the dying world. And I think that in a way that the world kind of expects us to stand up for what is right. And when Christians don't, they kind of like, hmm, aren't you supposed to do this or do that? So I feel that that is, um, that we could have this boldness because of the Lord and that we should never, ever, ever be ashamed of, um, of that. And by doing that, we become women that impact impact the world that we're in, wherever God has you. I've seen this in my own life um, at school. I am going to school right now, and almost every single time that I go to school, especially this one professor that I have, attacks the Lord, attacks the Lord, attacks Jesus. And she says, because of these Christians, because of these, and every, and I'll just share this super quick with you guys, but one day she was just like bashing and I'm just like, Lord, I'm like, I want to say something. And I always pray. I always pray before I speak and I ask the Lord to give me an opportunity. And if he does, I do it. And then we had watched this one th video. And then after the video, she's just, oh, all these Christians, all these Christians murdered all these people. All of this was done in the name of God. And she's like, what do you guys all think about that? I'm like, I'm like, and so I just raised my hand and I told her, you know, I am a Christian and I do love the Lord. And I know that my God was not okay with what happened there. My God loves and that's not the God that I know. And then I just told her, you know, that really just shows us the, the depravity of our own heart, of man's heart. And she was just quiet. But she's still nice to me. I'm still getting a good grade. So I'm like, thank you, Lord. But so I think that everywhere we can stand. We stand um, for, for, for the Lord, always standing. And um, yes, so I believe that God blesses us. Like I've seen that in my own life again, just God blessing me um, just because I stand for what's right. In my, um, I have this one sister, she might be watching, so she is, hi, Buffy. But I have um, 35, I have 35 brothers and sisters I was adopted. And um, out of all those 35, there, I've been walking with the Lord for a while, and many times they've laughed at me, they've made fun of me. And I'm just like, whatever, <laughs> you know, I just keep doing, I know this is the truth, so I, I stick with it. But I have one sister that is on fire for the Lord, and her kids were here on Sunday, and they got baptized here. And I'm just like, wow, Lord. Like, I just feel if we impact just one person, that's huge, you know, and to see her on fire and in her own community, just being a fire for the Lord is amazing. So God will bless us when um, we just stand when we stand and deny ungodliness, we, when we deny ungodliness. So the second thing that Paul tells us is to deny worldly lusts. And worldly uh, relates, uh, is defined as relating to or devoted to this world. 
and its pursuits rather than God. So I just like just think of that word, that devotion to world, worldly things. Lust is an intense longing and a craving. And God teaches us to deny this. And we might say, as women of the word, we might say, oh, or think that this is not an issue for us. And when I was doing this, the Lord's like, yes, it's an issue. It's an issue for me. And because God said is it, God says it's an issue, I think that it is an issue. Um, what is our motivation in this world? I know that for me, that my motivations when it comes to worldly lust, that my motivations are not always focused on Christ first, if I'm honest, it's not. And I love this so much about the word of God that when I am faced with truth from God, it's like I have to look at myself and I have to examine myself and I have to see myself for what I am. I can't, I'm forced to look within and I'm forced to admit that I do have these lusts and that they sometimes come before God. Some worldly lusts for us can be our homes, cars, money, keeping up with the Joneses, our husbands, our children, our career, our position within our society, wanting to be married, wanting children. And although all of these things are good things, they are all very good things, but if any of them come before our devotion to God, then they have become a worldly lust and should be put in the proper order, only subject to God, nobody else. So that was kind of for me, like, okay. <laughs> but instead, instead of those two things, God's word tells us, teaches us to live soberly, to live righteously and godly. And soberly is, is defined as marked by calm, dignified character or demeanor. And I like that. <laughs> And then um, righteously is acting in accord with divine or moral law. And for us, our divine is Jesus and our moral law is Jesus. Um, and godly just means divine and devout, pious. So when, my next question is, when should we live soberly, righteously, and godly? At the end of verse 12, it says, in the present age. <clears throat> In our society, things look bleak. We'll, we live in an immoral world, a world that keeps pushing the Lord away, a world where 2 Timothy 3, 2 to 5 describes saying that men will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, unloving, unforgiving, slanderers, without self-control, brutal, despisers of good, traitors, headstrong, haughty, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, having a form of godliness but denying its power. And God tells us to, to stay away from those people. So when should we be living soberly, righteously, godly? Now, now in this age. Our Christ-like behavior impacts a lost and dying world. And I think that we always hear that, that our behavior affects people outside of these walls. But I believe that it also affects people in these walls. As Christians, none of us have got it together, 100%. Um, but we can, by our godly um, lifestyle, we can encourage each other to Christ-likeness just by the way that we behave. So um, for all of you wives that are in here, um, I just love this and I thought of it and so I wrote it. It says, if you have an unbelieving husband, if that just by your behavior, without a word from you, that your husband could be brought to the Lord. That's powerful. Just by our behavior, that your husband would see you and say, um, I'm whatever, <laughs> that she's so good, look at her, and that he would come to know the Lord because of your behavior. To the single woman, by the grace of God, God is with you, and then as single women, we submit ourselves to God. We live pure and holy lives, trusting and being 100% satisfied where God has us. This speaks volumes because 
even in the church and outside of the church, we see women that are looking for love, looking for something, looking, always searching for that. And in those times, hurting ourselves, trying to find something that all of us in this room already know and that we have found it in Jesus. So I think that that speaks a lot. Um, to the woman who has, been, who has done terrible things to herself, when you surrendered your life to Christ, God says that he loves you and he has forgiven you. 2 Corinthians 5.17 says, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away. All things have become new. The enemy comes and creeps and lies to us and tries to condemn us of the things that we did 30, 20, 10 years ago, of the things that we did maybe even this morning. The enemy is always creeping and always trying to lie to, lie to us and trying to deceive us. But the, but the Bible tells us now, by grace, we can live soberly, righteously, godly. You are a new creation in Christ. To the woman who has been betrayed, you are not alone. There is now a part of you that has experienced the same thing that our Savior experienced. If you allow the Lord, he will be your strong tower. In pain and suffering, in the darkest times of your life, you commit your heart and mind to the Lord. Trouble and pain will come. You remain steadfast. Prepare yourself before trials come. And I think that's so important because we think that this life is just going to be always easy. We're Christians. We love the Lord. We're just standing for righteousness. We're doing all these things. But problems will always come. So I just say to prepare yourselves before trials come. And I think of Job. The Bible says that Job was a righteous man, that he was a worshiper of God. He was a wealthy man who had worked all his life to take care of his family and his, and his children and his wife, and he was protected by God. The word tells us that he lost his livelihood, his children died, his wife died, he suffered physical pain, he lost everything that he had. He must have had so much anguish and despair and even fear because God didn't tell him this is what's going to happen. But through it all, Job st stood strong. And I often wonder, like, how long, how long, because like, suffering is not fun, <laughs> but how long did Job suffer? Was it a week, two weeks, a month, three months, a year, two years? I don't know. But I think that he suffered for a long time to lose your family, to lose everything, and everything. I just feel like that it was a long time. But Job remained steadfast. And Job is an excellent model for us. He purposed in his heart and mind to worship God all his life. And I'm reading, I'm listening, I'm not reading, I'm listening to this audio book by Charles Swindle. It's called, What If God Has Different Plans? And he says, he says this beautiful thing, and when I heard it, I'm like, pretty good. So he says, when your heart is right and your possessions don't drive your life and you walk humbly and obedient before the Lord, loss does not devastate you. Loss can, cannot dismantle your faith. And I love that because if our mind is on the Lord, like nothing can knock us down. If our heart is for the Lord and we've made this decision to follow God at all costs, nothing is going to knock us down. Job was held by grace just as we are. Job never turned from God. In his pain and suffering, he, in suffering, he remained steadfast. He had made up his mind to follow the Lord no matter what it cost him. And I'm just going to share this one Job moment for me that I really feel has really transformed my life. I had just um, gotten married um, and probably like six weeks, I want to say, five, six weeks, I don't know, 
um, we found out that I, that I was pregnant and I was so happy. I'm like, yes, like I had waited for so long to get married and now I'm having a baby. But I knew, I knew that something was wrong. I knew something was wrong. I started bleeding a little bit and um, there was a night where I'm just, I was just laying in bed and um, I told the Lord, I was just crying and I was just, just crying and praying. And I'm like, Lord, you know, if I lose this baby, it's okay, God, I'll love you. If you give me this baby, I'll love you anyways. I'll worship you anyways. And I did. I ended up losing that baby. But I think that was a pivotal night for my Christian faith because in that night, I had made up my heart and my mind that no matter what happened to me, I was going to love and I was going to follow God. And so when my, hus my husband at the time, when my husband betrayed me and left me, it shook me. I'm not going to lie and say oh, it didn't shake me. It did. But I just remembered that, that God has always been with me and that I had made that commitment to love the Lord no matter what, no matter what. So when I, um, when I look at these women that I just described to you guys, the wife, I was once a wife, and I was once married to a man. It was really difficult. He was difficult to be married to. He was often angry, um, mistreated, and was harsh to me and to my children. And by God's grace in that marriage, I learned to cling to God. I learned that God was everything that I needed. I learned to worship God at all costs. I worship God, I would come here and I would cry and I'd be worshiping God and knowing that God was with me. Now I'm, I'm a single woman and by God's grace, I'm learning to be 100% satisfied where God has me. He is all I need. He is the best friend and best provider that I could ever ask for. He is good for my soul and I really am at peace with that. To the woman who has hurt herself, I'm that woman also from, um, I was thinking this morning, but from the time that, from the ages between 17, I was almost 18, from the ages of 17 to 22, um, I, had, I had three abortions before I was 22 years old. I had three abortions. And although this breaks my heart, I have accepted that I am forgiven and I am loved by God. By his grace and only by God's grace, I have no shame, absolutely no shame. I have no guilt and I believe that I am a new creation in Christ. I have learned by God's grace to believe what God says about me. I am forgiven and free and I just have to say praise God. When should we be, li be living soberly, righteously, godly? Now. No matter where you are in life, the grace of God, let the grace of God train you and keep you and let everything that happens to you be for the glory of God, the good and the bad. My next question are, is, where are we to look? So verse 13 tells us, looking for the blessed hope and glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. Our blessed hope is Jesus. We look to him, and by grace, we wait for his glorious return. If we really believe that Jesus is who he claimed to be, which is God, then we will remember that our God is great, that God is always with us, he is always working. He's always transforming us more and more into his image. And I've learned, just a little side note, <laughs> and I learned, like, through suffering is the way that God changes us, us, us the most. Like, we hate it. But that's where I found in my own life that God has changed me so much through suffering. So when suffering comes your way and hardships come your way, just know that God is there with you and that he's using that to change you more and more into his image. Um, I think of Isaiah in Isaiah 6.1. He says that he, 
he saw the Lord sitting on a throne, high and lifted up, and that the train of his robe filled the temple. And my favorite part of this verse is the angels that were present there cried, holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. By grace, we remember our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, and how holy, holy, holy he is. When we have the right perspective of Christ, we have the strength to live this life. We can overcome loss, pain, and hardship. He is our blessed hope. We look to him and wait for his return. And my next question is why? Why would Jesus sacrifice his life for us? Especially since we're, since we're just these little sinners. But why would Jesus do that? Verse 14 tells us, who gave himself for us that he might redeem us and purify for himself his own special zealous, his own special people zealous for good works. This verse, I think, is so beautiful and so intimate. Everything that Christ does is motivated by his love for us. He paid a price we could never pay. By his grace, we are redeemed, we are purified, we are his special people. Isn't it ironic that Jesus was beaten, he was spit upon, he was whipped, he was bruised, he was crucified, all for the love of you and me and for all mankind, and that he suffered so much, yet we are the ones that benefit. I think that's like so huge. I love that he calls us his own special people. He knows everything about us, the good, the bad, and the ugly. He knows everything about us, yet we are still so precious to him. Our reasonable response is to live our life for him. Paul tells us that we should be zealous for good works, and to have zeal means to have great energy or enthusiasm in pursuit of, for us in pursuit of Jesus. Jesus is the object that we admire. By grace, I am learning to be zealous for good works. And, I've, and I'm learning that I just see from my own life when I'm serving the Lord, it helps others. Like God uses me to help other people. And I love that. But by his grace, he changes me when I'm over there helping other people. I feel that by serving the Lord, it keeps my heart and mind focused on the Lord. I'm not apt to get depressed. I'm not apt to be angry at life situations. I'm not apt to be afraid of the unknown or to feel alone. I'm not apt to fall away. By grace, I am humbled and honored to be about my father's business. I think that's huge because sometimes um, we can get so stuck on what's going on with us and we just stay there. But when we go and serve, like maybe someone can go help Shelly's team, that will change your life. That will change your life. You could change the life of a little child, but God will change your life while you're serving him. So amazing. That's something that's really helped me in my life, to be honest. So how, how do we live this truth out? Verse 15 says, speak these things, exhort and rebuke with all authority. Let no one despise you. So the first thing is that Paul tells us is to speak. And I know for me, I have so much idle speech. Sometimes I... I Try not to gossip, but every, every once in a while I find myself, I'm like, Ooh, nope, I got to exit this conversation. So many things that we say, they're not glorifying the Lord. Um, maybe I could just complain or whatever. But to speak, we should speak of God's grace that brings salvation. We should speak of living righteously, soberly, and godly. We should speak of our blessed hope and his return. We should speak about how he came to purify and redeem us for himself. We should speak of how we, to each other, that'd be sweet, <laughs> to speak to each other about how you are so special to him. The second thing is to exhort. And it, to exhort means to strongly urge someone to do something. We can exhort people in the Lord, but how? How? 
by his grace, by the way that we live our life, speaks measures to family, to friends, to acquaintances. Let us be women that without a word, us too, we can impact just by how we live. We can impact the people around us. The third thing is rebuke with all authority. Christ lives in us and we have this Holy Spirit power that we often forget that we even have. We stand fast, we stand for the truth, even if it may cost us everything. And all of this, I just have to say, all of this always needs to be in love. So I'll just end with this, and I want us to go back to Isaiah, into the throne room. If we are honest with ourselves, and if we're honest with God, there are so many times that we forget how holy and righteous God is. Sometimes we go through the motions. We, we let the cares of this world pull us down. We listen to the lies of the enemy. And sometimes it's not even the enemy that's lying to us. Sometimes the lies are just in here in our own mind, and it's us. And we let our, our, those thoughts plague us. We, when, we, when we are in that dark and lonely place, let us remember our great God. Let us picture him in his throne room. His glory is so majestic. Holy, holy, holy is our God. He is full of grace and mercy. Let us choose this morning to be trained by his grace. And I always, a huge thing for me is always, that it is our choice. It is our choice to remember God's holiness and how holy he is. And I think that when we're going through things, if we could just remember that the angels are right there in the presence of God and they could not be quiet. And they're like, holy, holy, holy is our God. That holy God will get us through everything and all the troubles and everything in this life. So I will just leave you guys with that. So just remember that. If you don't remember anything, holy, holy, holy. Yes, Lord, you're here with me. So Psalm 73, 26. My flesh and my heart fail, but God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. So let me just pray, and that's it. Lord, we thank you, God, that you are a holy, holy, holy God. Lord, we could say a million holies for you, Lord. And I just pray for each of us, God, that we would remember, Lord, that we would remember that you are so great and so powerful, Lord. May we just fully surrender our, our heart and our life to you, God. And just may we sense your love and know that we are never alone, God. And everything that happens to us, God, you have a part in it, Lord. You are in control, God. And we are so thankful, Lord. We're so thankful that we know you and that... Um, you have been so good to us through it all, Lord. So I just thank you, and I thank, and I pray for these women, God, just as um, they're just sitting here, Lord. I don't know what anyone is going through, Lord, but you do, God, and I pray that they would sense your love for them, God, and I thank you for them, Lord, and I just thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.